Julie, welcome to Saltier Politics this week. How are you doing? I got to be honest, I'm a little stressed out at this current work-life situation. Um, I think a lot of moms and dads feel the same way that I feel, but I've become kind of a full-time second grade teacher, which is harder than I think being a full-time high school teacher because a second grader doesn't really know how to function on his own or sit and complete assignments on his own. So uh, he gets assignments through school and then he has to actually complete them, which means that I have to sit there with him while he completes them um, while trying to do my own work and keep my business afloat. As you can imagine, it's tough times for everybody from a business perspective. So I've had to really focus on that as well. And then, you know, at the same time, make dinner, make three meals a day now because obviously <laughs> nobody's going out to eat. Um, or otherwise, um, being fed in school. So I have to, you know, make breakfast, lunch, and dinner for everybody and clean around the house. And it's a, it's a lot. Well, showing people the real deal was you had this Facebook post talking about your situation and your experience. And I thought maybe saying a little bit of that would be helpful to a lot, yeah. a lot of people. I really want people to listen to what I'm saying. I know that it's just one person's experience and it's obviously not empirical data. But trust me when I say that this is something that I promise you is happening over and over. You know, they talked about the number of people who've had positive COVID tests. I don't know whether I'm even part of that statistic. Um, and I'll just start chronologically. I think you remember, um, I'd say probably around March 12th or so, um, I started getting achy. My body started to feel achy, but I was really run down. I was working super hard. Um, I happen to have had either meetings um, at night or dinners, or I had to take my son to a hockey game um, that week. So I, I thought maybe I was feeling run down and it wasn't anything serious. Anyway, um, but once I started feeling achy, I immediately decided to get him out of Dodge and I sent him to his grandparents' house across the river in New Jersey, just in case. And I'm glad I did because progressively I started to feel worse and worse and worse. Um, then I developed this dry cough and I thought, oh no, you know, this sounds like the telltale sign of the coronavirus. Um, I waited probably until the following week, um, and walked over to city MD, which here in New York, I think, you know, is, is just a kind of like an, not an urgent care, but it's a walk-in clinic. I didn't have the strength to even call my primary care physician and take the subway to see her. So I walked across the street to city MD, um, to say, look, I think I might have this thing. Can I, can I get tested? And the doctor kind of laughed at me and said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 46. And he said, do you have any preexisting conditions? And I said, no. And he said, do you live with anybody who has any preexisting conditions? And I said, luckily, no. Uh, he said, well, I'm sorry, but we have very limited number of tests. So we're not really going to waste, he didn't say waste one on me, but effectively said, don't even, we're not going to give you one. Um, we don't have that many to give. We have to save them for people who actually really are endangered. And then he said, look, um, the advice I'd give you if you're positive, if you had had a positive test or not is the same, which is just go home and self-isolate for two weeks just in case. Um, I'm going to give you some advice. Don't bother going to the emergency room or, unless you really are dying because even if you have pneumonia, they're so overwhelmed. And now, granted, this is a month ago. This is not even now. But I don't recommend that you go to the ER unless you really think you're about to die. So I said, okay, well, I don't really feel that way. So I went home. And I self-isolated and within a couple of days, um, the cough continued, but then I started having difficulty breathing um, and kind of felt like somebody was punching me in the throat. Um, and then I lost my sense of taste and smell. So I really didn't have an appetite. And then the chronic exhaustion set in and I was just exhausted. I was just wiped. And that went on probably start to finish. I would say the last of my symptoms from start to finish was probably 10 days. Um, so, once my symptoms were done, I waited another, I don't know, maybe a week, week and a half, even two weeks. And I decided to go to Mount Sinai, which is a hospital here in New York, which is doing some a very innovative, I think other hospitals are as well, but they're doing this innovative blood plasma treatment where they take the plasma from people who've had COVID and assuming they have the antibodies that they've developed to fight off COVID, they're transferring that blood and that plasma to people who are in the hospital now who really, really need it because they're, they're on the verge of death. So I said, okay, well, I don't know if I had it or didn't have it, but just in case I did have it, why don't I go get this blood plasma and give blood just in case if they can use it to help somebody else. So I walked over to Mount Sinai 
and uh, I gave blood. And then a week later, which is last Thursday. So now we're talking well over a month. We're talking from the start of my symptoms. It's now the 21st um, of April. My first symptoms came about, uh, I would say, March 12th. So we're talking five weeks or so. Um, last week, which was a month, I got a call back from Mount Sinai. that, And they said, yes, you know, in fact, you did have COVID. Um, but you don't you're not, your antibodies are still not strong enough. You don't haven't built up the antibodies yet to fight this thing. Can you wait 10 days and then come back um, and give blood again to see if you've now built up enough antibodies? So the point is this thing is still in my system and my, I haven't developed enough antibodies um, according to Mount Sinai as of last week to fight off an infection on behalf of somebody else. This is what scares me so much about them opening things up again because how little they know. Exactly. And what's so weird about this is I would have told you two, three weeks ago that I felt just fine. I mean, I, you know, I waited my two weeks. I was contagious. People said, don't go outside until um, about three days after the last of your symptoms, which is exactly what I did. Um, and lo and behold, I, you know, two weeks, three weeks after my symptoms were over, um, apparently I still have don't have the antibodies in my blood, um, enough antibodies to fight this thing off on behalf of somebody else. If I were to give my blood to somebody else, I don't know whether that means I'm still infectious um, or whether I'm still infected. I mean, what the fact that I'm still infected is fine because I feel fine. Um, but whether I can transmit this to somebody else or they don't really know much. So the point is tomorrow I'm going back to Mount Sinai to give blood again. They'll probably wait another week and tell me whether I have enough antibodies now um, to actually give plasma um, to help others. But the point is not so much that. The point is that we don't know. And what's so scary to me is that there are people who are saying, well, you know, it's not as bad as you think, so let's open everything up. Uh, we need the economy to get going. The economy is not going to get going if people are sick and dying and if they're too scared to go to work or to go to the supermarket or to sit next to anybody. Um, because you don't know, a lot of people are asymptomatic. I mean, uh, nobody else in my house got, had any symptoms. I have, you know, I never bothered getting tested, but I can assure you. And, and just how fragile this, yeah. yeah, this house of cards is, Julie, because it's like, okay, let's say you still had it and they didn't know. And they're like, oh yeah, you can be around people. And then your parents take care of your son. So if your parents got sick and could no longer take that, then you have to be 110% all the time around your son, then you, your business falters. Well, let's go a step further. Right. So I got this thing. Um, I didn't know I had it. I thought I was just exhausted. It so happened mercifully coincided with spring break. Um, so the next morning I, we were going to go, I don't know if I ever told you this, we were going to go visit some family in France for spring break. Obviously that got canceled. Um, so I said, okay, I'll send him to his grandparents' house just so that he has a place to run around in the suburbs and then Somebody can be with him, you know, 24 seven because I was working. Um, so, I mean, the coincidence of this, the timing was perfect for me. So I sent him there. I, I have no idea whether he was a little carrier. Right. My, my, my parents have shown no symptoms, luckily. But look, my parents are in their mid to late 70s. Um, my father is going to be angry for me for saying this publicly, but my father has had heart issues. Uh, my mother has arthritis, which apparently is a pre-existing condition that, that for this, for the purposes of this, I mean, this is not, these are not people who could withstand, could, maybe they could, but, but maybe they couldn't, um, the virus. And so, uh, you know, who knows? And, um, others that I was around during that period are asymptomatic, but I'm positive that they had it because there's no way, um, being as close proximity to me as they were that they didn't get it. Um, so maybe they're carriers who know, maybe I, who knows? We don't know. The point is until we do testing, um, and real testing and real contact tracing, um, who knows? I mean, who knows? Assume, and, and in terms of people talking about, well, let's open up the schools. Nobody on earth wants their kid to go back to school more than me. I mean, trust me, his brain is atrophying because I'm a horrible second grade teacher. I don't have the patience. Um, Obviously, it's not the same experience as it would be in school. Um, I can't get really any work done while he's here because it's constantly, you know, the usual mommy, mommy, mommy um, scenario. And so I, I would love for him to go back to school. But let's assume that he was a little carrier, that he did get it from me, that he showed no symptoms. Then he takes it to school. He's got teachers who are older. He's got faculty who are in a very high risk group. 
Um, he had a teacher who unfortunately passed away um, from COVID. So um, it's uh, it's terrifying. I mean, it's, it's awful. And um, I don't I don't even know how to begin to reopen this. I, I'm in New York. You're in Florida right now. But, you know, when once you come back to the city, I know you've been gone for like a month. But I'll tell you, I don't understand. Let's say tomorrow Donald Trump and Andrew Cuomo snapped their fingers and said, OK, back to normal. Business is normal. Nobody's going to abide by it. No, that, yeah. And in, in that story that you, you posted just about you and about the antibodies, just really, it just sent kind of a wave of fear, I guess, th- because it's just how little is known and which is what I hope people understand who are tired of the social distancing. We all are, but. And that's the thing. I mean, look, I happen to be lucky enough to live in a city that has the serology test where I volunteered to go give blood. So it wasn't that somebody was making me do it. And they said to me, and this is Mount Sinai, which, you know, is a hugely important um, hospital in New York, um, said that I don't have the antibodies for it. How many people are getting antibody tests done? I mean, probably 0.01% of the country is getting antibody tests done. And I, it's not like somebody made me do it. I did it because I wanted to help other people. So, um, I just don't get it. I mean, I don't understand what people are talking about when they say, let's open everything up. You look at what happened in Milwaukee and Wisconsin when the Supreme Court stupidly allowed people to vote in person um, or mandated that they had to, that they wouldn't extend absentee ballot voting, vote by mail for another week. Lo and behold, there are now seven, I believe seven as of today, cases tied to that. Well, seven is not really seven, right? Right. Seven plus whoever they've been in touch with plus whoever those people have been in touch with, and so on and so forth. Um, well, so good luck to people who think, you know, Florida, people, I mean, oh. you're, you're, I mean, your governor is opening up beaches. Oh, I have something to talk about, and that brings us perfectly. So Ron DeSantis deemed the WWE a central. Well, and, of course, because they're big Republican donors. R- well, exactly. And his rationale was, I think people have been starved for content. So are you starved for wrestling content? Just, well, um, I'm not. Or maybe I'm not the demographic who he's talking about. Um, people are not starved for content. Give me a break. He's star- he starved for campaign cash because the WWE was standing to lose a gajillion dollars if they weren't able to televise this thing. And, and like, how do you, I guess, the business needs, like, what about nail salons or, you know, those customers, restaurants who desperately need patients? How do, how do you reconcile that and say I mean, the WWE is more important than your restaurant. Like, Well, the, your restaurant doesn't donate to Ron DeSantis, right? They're not big Republican donors. Right. And the WWE is also incidentally based in Connecticut, not Florida. So it's, it's just like not helping direct state. No. And, and look, the problem is that you've got a bunch of people in social media who are wagging the tail is wagging the dog, right? It's social media. It's Rush Limbaugh. It's conservative talk radio. It's conservative TV, um, all of whom are so desperate to get the economy going again, which I, by the way, I empathize with. I understand. I cannot tell you the amount of money that my business has lost in the last month and a half. I mean, just it's a fact. Um, But you're not going to get the economy going if people are sick and dying. You're just not. And and in fact, you're going to make it worse because you're going to reopen it for a couple of weeks then what happened in New York is going to happen in Florida and other states that are doing this, Georgia. Um, and then lo and behold, you're going to have to shut everything down again because people are truly, hospitals are going to get overwhelmed. I mean, New York, it's interesting. I think Andrew Cuomo and other governors in the Northeast um, in proximity to New basically governors in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, waited too long to shut everything down. Um, California, Washington state shut things down earlier and it was the right thing to do, but we didn't need to wait for them to do it. We should have seen what was happening in Italy and in China and across Europe. I mean, don't forget this thing's been traveling east to west. And so we've seen what the effects of this virus are. Well, again, this thing is traveling in some ways east to west, although the, the, the west coast has been hit pretty much too. Um, it's coming. I mean, New York and New Jersey suffered tremendously. It's beginning to stabilize somewhat, but 
that's because they had really draconian lockdown measures. And for anybody that says, well, not everybody's New York, not everybody's riding the subway, not everybody's packed like sardines, it's not true. I mean, the reality is that South Dakota at the Smithfield plant, the pork producing plant in South Dakota, had um, a huge viral outbreak of this thing. There's industry in every state. And those people come into contact with other people and people who are on the beaches in Florida. Remember how Ron DeSantis wouldn't allow anybody who lives in Florida, who was getting off a plane in New York, he was from New York. He was telling them to self quarantine for two weeks once they got to Florida. Well, guess what? Em? Now that you're in Florida, maybe when you come back, you'll have to self quarantine when you get back to New York because what he's doing is insane. I just, I want to see his market research where the product is greater than the wealth, the health and well being of his staff because I, of like the WWE staff. Um, it, of any- well, I, you know, I don't want to hear any more about pro-life, right? It's crap. I don't want to hear any more about being pro-life because you now have people publicly saying that we're willing to absorb a certain number of deaths if it means getting the economy going again. Right. And okay, fine then I guess you're willing to absorb, absorb if you believe that abortion is murder a certain number of deaths so that a young woman can go to college and not have to raise a baby. Yeah, because if it's for the good of everybody else, if that's I your... Mean, yeah, I mean, if it's for the greater good, then you're, if it's for the greater good. I mean, you know, the reality is that um, I'm not willing to sacrifice my parents for any economy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and... I I don't want to sit here like I'm sitting here in my ivory tower, you know, and sitting on a pile of cash thinking, you know, let let them eat cake. I am, I'm telling you, business is not good. I mean, it is directly affecting my bottom line in a very tremendous way. So nobody's more eager to get back to work than me. Nobody's more eager to get the economy going than me, um, than I, I guess. Um, I, uh, I would love nothing more than to meet you for a drink the next time we see each other in a bar the way we usually do uh, or to go out to dinner or to do the things that I love doing. I mean, everything about New York involves socialization. I mean, you know, there's a reason why I live in New York. There's a reason why you live in New York. It's because you walk outside and it's vibrant and there's crowds and you have great restaurants and you have great theater and you've great got the arts and you've got museums. I mean, all the things that make New York New York worth living. All the reasons that people pay an astronomical amount of money to live in New York, the culture, the 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 energy, it's gone. It's not here. Believe me, I mean, I'm paying a tremendous amount of money to live in a city that might as well be living, you know, on Guam right now. It doesn't make a difference, except that I've got Central Park, which is also fairly abandoned. Um, but there are, you know, are obviously prettier parks in nature. Um, so I would love to get back into the way things were. I'm just not willing to sacrifice my parents to do it. Absolutely. Uh, And I don't think anybody else should either. And let me just say one more thing about that because it drives me insane. And I want people to listen very carefully to this and take this from me who has been, uh, who's worked in TV and on different, at different TV stations over the years. All the people who are telling you to go outside and to stop the social distance, to get back to work, their entire life is about social distancing. You had a great post about Dr. Phil, I believe, when he was sitting inside. I mean, Dr. Phil has, believe me, Dr. Phil does not walk around. Dr. Phil leaves his studio, I am sure, under escort so that no fan can approach him if he's not doing it on a closed lot. Dr. Phil has nobody approaching him at all after he's you know his studio audience doesn't get to go up and shake dr phil's hand the studio audience is screened by producers it is kept far away from him dr phil comes out dr phil does his show and dr phil goes back to his dressing room he does not come into contact with anybody he doesn't want to come into contact with i am positive that dr phil has a car that takes him to the private car that takes him to the studio each and every day or he if he doesn't it's because he drives himself in a car. He doesn't take public transportation to get to where he's going. Dr. Phil doesn't come into, Dr. Phil probably lives 
in a gated community or in some high rise with a doorman. Dr. Phil does not get, he, if he has a backyard, it's large enough for him to walk around it and not have to run into other people in public parks. So the reality is, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm using Dr. Phil as an example. Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Rush Limbaugh, um, everybody, you know, Janine Pirro. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to talk out of school. I've been to Janine Pirro's house. Believe me, she's not living on top of anybody else. Um, and so the point is, it, it, it drives me crazy because it's the people who are telling you to go out there. I know how you get to work. By the way, you work in the same building as a lot of the people who are saying that they should stop, that we should stop the self quarantine. I know how you get to work. You walk through crowded streets or you take the subway, right? Right. Um, you're the one who's going to get sick if they right. stop the quarantine. If you're mandated to go back to work right now, I, I've said consistently, I'm a very fortunate person. I mean, I worked hard to get to where I am, but the reality is, uh, look, I'm in a great place. I'm not at the, I'm not a cashier at the supermarket who has to wear some, you know, 10 day old face mask. If she's even lucky to have one or a scarf, uh, because she has to earn minimum wage to make sure that I eat. Right. Right. I can get it delivered or I can go in and out very quickly to the, to the cashier. I'm not stocking the shelves. I'm not at all. You know, those people are the ones who are going to die. No. And I, I, you know, we talk about, sorry, but we talk about why, it's, you know, minorities, people of color who are the ones who are having outsized death rates. Well, it's not because they're less healthy, although unfortunately a lot of them live in food deserts, so they are less healthy as a result of that. Um, but it's also because they're the ones performing these jobs. They're the ones who are at, on the front lines. They're right. the ones, they're, you know, they're the nurses who are making these people comfortable when they're on the ventilator. They're the ones right. at the cash, cash register. They're the ones pumping your gas. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's frustrating to me. It's awful. Well, going kind of right into that, into what I guess I'm, is making me happy, but also something I learned that this, this week. So I did, uh, one of my friends, she has a brother who's 27. He's in a group home. He has severe autism and is um, aggressive. And he is in a life's work group home in Long Island. And we did this run this weekend and raised like $600 uh, for direct service professionals who work in these group homes. But what I didn't realize is because now with social distancing, the workers who work there, the direct service professionals, they are now taking up all the things because Parents can't visit, friends can't visit, mm -hmm. uh, and these people need to be around uh, the residents for 24-7 because they can't do anything on their own. They need to have someone to brush their teeth. And they also, it's all the same issues of nursing homes, but now it's issues you have patients who may get aggressive, who, who have d more uh, challenges to overcome. And it was just something that was really eye-opening to me because it doesn't impact me directly. But just to your point about the people who are very underappreciated and these direct service professionals are paid minimum wage as well because they don't get the funding at um, like life's work and that, where they can get paid a ton of money. And it's just all these service professionals who are just, you know, sacrificing. Yeah. And uh, I keep thinking, is this the thing that's going to make us really focus on inequality in this country? And then I remember, of course not, because the 2008 crash happened and uh, look, we got bailed out and look at this most recent congressional bailout, um, which the president thinks is going swimmingly. But look who's getting bailed out. Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Meanwhile, I know small business owners who applied and were told, sorry, uh, we're out of money. And the reason they're out of money is because the big banks, the JP Morgans of the world, and others who are helping their clients are able to short circuit the process. You apply through your local bank, right? Well, if your local bank is holding deposits from a company that's worth millions of dollars, they're going to take that call a lot sooner than they're going to take with somebody who's on the margins. And so the people on the margins are the last ones who are getting bailed out. My neighborhood, I mean, Emily, I'm sure when you come back, you'll see this too. Your neighborhood, I'm sure, is the same way. My neighborhood, all the small restaurants and the small shops except the really, really, really huge successful ones, 
are shut down. Um, and I don't know that they're ever going to reopen. Right. Well, Cubbyhole actually recently just had a big GoFundMe because they're only cash and they only do bar. It's only drinking there. So it's it's the only lesbian bar really in New York City. So uh, I know I just did donate it to the GoFundMe because, I mean, there's one there's one of these places and it's it's a complete meeting place. And, and these places are just the lifeblood, I think, of the culture of the city. And Yeah, right. The little... Um... There's a little restaurant. It's not a restaurant. It's a takeout. It's a pizza joint slash like sandwich shop um, that's been here for ages, um, a, a block from my house. That I can't tell you how many times I'd stop there to, to get a sandwich or just slice of pizza or just you know something when you're in a rush and you don't really feel like dealing. Right. They shut down. I don't know. Do they come back? I, well, most of these places operate on the margins. I don't know. Right. Uh, so it's just, it's very scary and it's sad and it's going to change. The, it makes me devastated because it changes the culture of the city. And for everybody saying, well, that's why we have to reopen very quickly because if we don't um, reopen quickly, we're in trouble. The economy is going to collapse. I get it. I mean, I get it. Those places need to reopen. Having said that, do you really think that a little shop like that is going to absorb people standing shoulder to shoulder um, trying to order pizza. And what's going to happen to the guy behind the counter who's giving you the pizza? Or what's going to happen to the guy behind the counter making your sandwich when everybody's breathing on him? Right. Um, who's often the only employee or the business owner. The business owner. Um, what's going to happen there? And it's one of these places, you know, people crowd in. But are you really going to wait on line? at a sandwich shop because they're not going to allow more than one or two people in at a time? Of course not. Right. You're in a hurry because you're in a hurry to get, I mean, New York's all about being in a hurry, right? You're in a hurry to get somewhere. You're in a hurry to get to work. You're in a hurry to grab a slice before you have to go to some, some meeting. You're in a hurry. Everything's about being in a hurry. Right. And um, if it's not a necessity, you're not going to deal with it. You're just not. And those people are going to suffer and it's awful. And I, you know, what, what can I say? It's just an awful situation. Well, what is, what is making, what made you smile this past week? It's been, I have to say, it's been, and I feel bad complaining. I am fortunate enough where I don't have to go work behind a cash register or, or be um, a, a provider, a uh, healthcare provider, or, or work a job where I need to show up. So I've been trying to work from home. And as I said, it's been really tough while trying to also balance the needs of a seven-year-old boy who's going stir crazy because he's super athletic and super has a lot of energies, you know, and, and, you know, being stuck home for 23 hours a day is not something that he really enjoys doing. But, um, uh, I've spent, you know, just when am I ever going to have the kind of time to spend with my son that I have right now? And as annoyed as I am, 23 hours and 59 minutes a day about it because it's nonstop. Mommy, I need this. Can I get that? Can you get me this? Can you make me that? Can you help me with this? Um, and I feel like, I don't know if other people's kids are experiencing the same thing. I feel like he's almost becoming much more needy. Like he's almost regressing to like, I need to hug my mom all the time because mom's around all the time. Like the independence is done. It's over. Like he's been set back to like baby years. We're like, you know, but if I look at the larger picture, I'm so grateful for the fact that we, we do have, I think, when else are you ever going to have this kind of time with your kid? Right. Uh, and in a large sense, I'm very happy about it. And that makes me smile. And it makes me grateful um, on a day to day, minute to minute basis. I want to rip my hair out. Um, and like right now when his friends don't stop texting him and I want to tell all of them to stop. I mean, one of them is texting my, my son to have a baby, which is <laughs> this is how they insult. This is how seven-year-old boys insult each other. They say to each other, "You have a baby." The other big insult is you have a girlfriend, and then they all go, "Ew, no, I don't." Ew, and they start accusing each other of having a girlfriend, which apparently is the most insulting thing in the world. Um, but um, I know I've I've now learned more fart jokes and more disgusting scatological humor, seven-year-old stuff that I've ever boy stuff that I ever wanted to know. Okay. Um, but I'm happy about it. I mean, I'm happy that we have this time together. And um, having said that, if they cancel camp this summer, I, I might be hanging from the nearest tree. Like, this, this 
I need him out of the house. I need him running around and getting his energy out. They can't cancel camp. I, I you know, uh, they got camp has got to happen. Uh, if it doesn't happen, I don't know what's going to happen. Because okay. I can't imagine being cooped up all summer. Um, but we might have, you know, look, having said that, if it is dangerous to have camp, I will suck it up and I don't know what we're going to do. Turn on the air conditioning here in our in New York and go to town. I wish we could go to our house in Massachusetts, but the internet there is kind of spotty. So I can't even go up there and work from there. Um, and I understand how preposterous it sounds that I'm even talking about having a second house when a lot of people are um, making a hard time, you know, having a hard time paying rent and putting food on the table. So I fully acknowledge that I'm very fortunate. How about you? What made you smile today? I've been getting to cook a lot of different foods and I learned how to make my grandma's meatball recipe, which was really fun. Is that a secret or can you share it? Because I've been cooking a lot too. Yeah, really the key was just different different kinds of meats, pork, veal, and beef. Got to do it all at once. I agree. Yeah. I've been cooking nonstop and, uh, you know, we're all going to be rolling out of here with like 7,000 pounds because it's, and I, you know, my problem is I have no sense of how to minimize um, recipes. So like if the recipe is serving six, I'll make it for six and then, I don't know what to do with the rest of it. So honestly, it is, I've been bringing it down to my doorman, and those people are on the front lines. I mean, they're dealing with delivery people, and they're dealing with visitors, and they're dealing with everybody coming in, coming up to them. So doormen have disproportionately died in New York. There's a high rate of death among doormen in New York. Um, so I brought food down to them. I mean, frankly, I would love to give food. Um, there's a home, there's a church not far from me that every Sunday serves the homeless. I don't know if it's appropriate for me to bring food to them that I've made, but maybe I'll check that out too. It's, uh, it's bad. It's not good here in New York. Well, I am happy to talk to you and I'm glad we got your story out there. And uh, I guess till next week until, or well, a trying week, but until yes. next, until next time. Stay safe, everybody. All right. Thanks, we'll talk bye. to you soon. All right. Bye, bye Julie.